Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, I am sorry I can't be with you. I think you're going to have a wonderful day today. And uh, I will, my penalty for not being is that I will miss this wonderful day. Uh, but I'm going to try and give you a sense in this, uh, by this technology, uh, a virtual sense of the kind of research I'm doing now. And it's research that I'm really quite excited about. And I hope that you share my excitement when I'm done. Uh, the intent of this research is to try and tease out from financial markets what they're predicting about the future. And for a lot of different reasons, some of which I'll go over, this has proved to be much more difficult than we think it should be. So why don't I turn to the slides now. I'm going to focus on the equity markets. And generically, the approach we take to figuring out what the markets are saying about the future is to look at the history of these markets. So typically, if we're trying to figure out what the risk premium is, what the expected return on stocks is going to be, we look historically at what the expected return has been. Similarly, typically, if we're trying to figure out how risky stocks will be in the future, we look at the historical risk or the historical standard deviation. This is the typical thing we do. I should say, by the way, at the outset, there are so many slides here, I can't possibly go through them. Uh, so I'm going to skip around, and I'm going to try and get to the heart of the matter uh, as quickly as possible. But the slides are there for completeness. So if you're really interested and curious about what's going on here, I encourage you to look further at the slides. So typically, we use history and statistics to estimate what's happened in the past. And we take the heroic assumption that what's happened in the past is what's going to happen in the future. Uh, I once gave a talk describing how we do this. And one of the members of the audience said to me, you only use past data. Don't you use any future data? And I said, well, if I knew the future, I could use it. But I don't know what the future is. But actually, it turns out I was wrong. There is a way of getting a sense, at least, of what the market thinks the future will be from looking at what the prices we see today are. We'd like to know. We can't possibly know what the stock market's going to do in the next six months, the next years, let alone the next day or two. But we can get some handle, some understanding of what kind of a probability distribution the market is assigning to the returns in the future. And that's our goal. I mean, financial markets, stocks, for example, price cash flows that extend out into the infinite future. They discount those flows and they apply some adjustment for risk and say, that's the value of these stocks. Shouldn't we be able to look at the value and turn it on its head and say from that we can get some sense of what the market must have thought the dividends and the cash flows and even the returns are going to be in the future? That's what we're going to try and do. Now, in the, in the fixed income markets for bonds, we already do some of that. So if you're trying to predict what's going to happen to interest rates going, say, three years out, you can just look at the current yield curve. Now, that's not going to tell you what interest rates are going to do. But if you go three years out on the yield curve, if you look at the difference between a four-year bond price and a three-year bond price, that's the forward rate. That's an interest rate that's embedded in today's prices of bonds. And to some extent, it's what the market thinks will happen to interest rates in the future. Of course, there might be a risk premium in it, so it's not exactly what the market thinks. But it's a, it's a forecast. And there is nobody in the fixed income markets, nobody who, who does anything with borrowing and lending or anything with the more sophisticated trading in these markets, who doesn't look at the current yield curve to get at least a sense of what the market thinks will happen. What I'm going to try and do is show you that you can do the same thing in the stock market. Uh, Forward rates, unfortunately, aren't unbiased. There's improvements to be made there. We'll talk about those improvements later. So let's talk about forecasting the stock market, forecasting equity markets. What do people do now? So we don't even do what we do in the fixed income market. In the fixed income market, we ask, what is a single point forecast? 
what is the market's expectation of what interest rates will be a year, two years, or in sometime in the future? We don't even do that for equities. Here's what we do in the equity markets. We use historical returns, as I described before, and we say, well, what we had for the past 50 years is what we can expect to get next year, or two years from now, or the next 10 years, even though we know that's not true. We build a model. So we have a lot of models we use. So a standard model is a dividend yield model. We have some predictions, some pricing models that tell us what the expected return or the yield should be on a stock. We have a projection of what the dividends would be from the current prices. We can reverse that and figure out what the dividends must be expected to be. So we built something like that. But that's about the best we can do. Uh, we survey market participants. This was one of the things that motivated me to do this work. Every month I get an email that says, what do I think the market's going to do over the next year or 10 years? And I never know the answer, and I suspect that everyone else who gets the email doesn't have a clue either. So I can't, you know, anyone who's using me as a survey, I know they're on pretty weak ground for doing that. We use something from option pricing called the risk neutral probability distribution of the Martingale measure. I'll talk about that in a little bit. What we want to do in the equity markets at the very least is what we do in the fixed income markets. We want to find the market's subjective expectation of what returns will be. And more importantly, we like to find the whole distribution. How risky do they think that forecast is? And if we could do that, it would open up a host of possibilities. I mean, the simplest kind of thing is for asset allocation. How can you really trust asset allocation if you don't know what the expected return is or should be? So we're going to try and look at that. And our starting point is going to be something that MIT pioneered. It's going to be the option pricing market, and that's where we're going to look. So this is the simple binomial model, and unfortunately, the graphic doesn't display it properly. So F over there. That's the probability. I'm starting with a stock with a current price of S, and I'm saying that's going to go up by, say, 10%. So A is the jump, 1.1S, and maybe B is a fall, 0.9S. It could go down by 10%. And F is the probability that it goes up, and 1 minus F is the probability it goes down. And if it goes up, it'll get to AS. And if it goes down, it'll get to BS. Now, one thing we know is that there's got to be a relationship between these parameters. Uh, this is a standard model, by the way, used uh, in just about every investment house in the world. Every bank that prices derivative securities use models like this. Uh, and they do it because if you string together a lot of different tiny little moves like these binomials, you can pretty much describe any kind of a probability that you might think would apply to that stock. So one thing the parameters have to be is the interest rate R. One plus the interest rate has to be less than A and bigger than B. Suppose that B was bigger than one plus the interest rate and A was bigger than B. Then the stock would always be the, the bond market. You would never invest and get a 5% interest, although nowadays everyone would love a 5% interest, but you wouldn't get, let's say, a 2% interest in the bond market if you had a stock market that no matter whether it went up or down, always beat the 5% move. So the interest rate has to be between the up move for a stock and the down move, just to prevent a sure arbitrage, a sure free bet. If there isn't any free thing like that, it turns out that you get these two simple equations. This has to be true. Now, P of A is the price of a security that we invent. It's called a digital security, and it pays you a dollar if the stock market goes up. And P of B is a simple security that pays you a dollar if the stock market goes down. So P of A is just 1 over 1 plus the interest rate times something we'll call pi. That's a special probability, and it just turns out to be that way. And P of B is 1 over 1 plus the interest rate, the discounted value of 1 minus pi. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, talking to an MIT audience is you can actually put equations up on the board. But this is about, there's one more, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have one set of awesome equations after this. Let's go quickly through here. 
This is the Black-Scholes-Merton model. And this is probably the most pioneering development in uh, all of financial economics and one of the most in economics. And uh, one of the founders, Bob Merton, is in the audience today. So you can ask him. You can see if I, if I say the right things about it. And I'm just going to put up all the equations because they're really quite complex. What you do is you, you have the same principle of the absence of arbitrage that applies in that simple world where the, model can go, the market can go up or down. But in, instead of starting with something that simple, you start with the top equation that says ds over s, that's the percentage change in the stock, will drift up by an amount mu, or it'll, and it also could have some randomness to it, and sigma dz is the randomness of it. And if you just follow through the implications of there not being a free lunch, of the stock not always being bond, or the bonds not always being stocks, then the equation underneath has to hold that complicated differential equation, which yields, which is quite famous, and it yields the very famous Black Scholes Merton solution. The first time I did this, I tried to remember it and I got it wrong, but I think it's right now. What's amazing about this formula? The last two lines. That's the price of an option. It depends upon the motion of the stock. If the stock goes up, or pardon me, whatever the stock value is, P of ST is its price, and we can solve for that. And what's remarkable, if you look at the equations at the bottom, something doesn't show up there. The thing that doesn't show up is the mu, the expected return on the stock. So the expected return on the stock plays no role in that, none whatsoever. If I go back a few slides, if I go back to that, P of A, the price of a dollar if the stock goes up, and P of B, the price of a dollar if the stock goes down, what does it not depend on? It doesn't depend on F, the probability that the stock will go up or the stock will go down. So you have this wonderful kind of uh, paradox. No matter how what you think the expected return on a stock is, no matter what you think the probability is that it will go up and down in the simple binomial model, you can price an option on that without knowing those parameters. So unfortunately, this is, and this is both, I should say, a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because, as anyone knows, the hardest thing to measure is what you expect the return on the stock market to be. But now I can figure out what an option is valued at without knowing that. But it's a curse because I'd like to be able to actually figure out the expected return on the stock by knowing something about option prices. So you have this two-edged sword. You can't figure out, uh, you can figure out what an option price would be without knowing what the expected return on the stock is. But that means that if you know the option price, you can't figure out the expected return on the stock. I think as a historical matter, too, this whole theory that we work with arose in a world in which we had uh, not very many options. The world is very different now. There's a huge, rich menu of options. And so I want to try and turn the theory on its head and look at the option prices and try and extract from them what the expected return is. So that's our goal here. Our goal is to build our challenges, to build a model that's simple like the other models, uh, that will explain option pricing, will be consistent with option pricing, but still has a hook in it that lets you go backwards from option pricing to figure out what stocks are. So let's start with options. So let's look at the option market. I think everyone knows in this audience what a put and a call is, but just to be clear about it, let's focus on a put. A put option is insurance. If you buy a 10% out of the money put on the stock market, for say a million dollars, if the market goes down by more than 10%, it pays you the difference on a million dollars between whatever it goes down. So if it goes down 15%, uh, you can't lose more than 10% because the option pays you 5%. It's a form of insurance. It's full coverage with a deductible of 10%. That's all a put option is. It's just insurance with a deductible. Well, the market prices these all the time. 
and not surprisingly, it uses the Black-Scholes-Merton formula to quote option prices. You have to be very careful. It doesn't say that option prices are determined by the formula. We know that's not quite right. But it does say, let's quote the price for the purpose of trading it, and we'll ask ourselves, what volatility, if you go back to the formula, the volatility played a role, what volatility do we have to put into the formula to get the price? And that's what it looks like. That's the pricing surface. So the axis closest to you is the strike. So 100% is a put option at the money. 80% is a put option with a 20% deductible. 120% is a call option that's 20% out of the money. So the market has to get to more than a 20% return to pay off. The axis going away from you is the maturity of the option half a year, one and a half years, two and a half years. The market has data for all of these things on every single day. And the axis going up is the volatility. That's the variance or the standard deviation you have to plug into that formula, the Black-Scholes-Merton formula, to get the price that you actually see the option being traded at in the market. And the surface almost always looks something like this. So if you look going away from you, it's higher at the back end than it is at the front. So the further out you go, the more out the value is assigned to the option. And it also, it's skewed. So it rises up as it goes to the left. And that reflects the fact that people are paying a lot of money for put options to protect themselves against big declines, even out of the money put options. So let's go to that. Remember, a put option is a form of insurance. And like any insurance, the price of a put is a product of three things. First, you're going to get paid off, let's say, a year from now if it's a one-year put, so you've got to discount the payoff. Second, it depends on the probability that you're going to actually have the option in the money, the probability of a crash, let's say. And third, it depends on how averse you are to that risk. And our problem is a delicate one. The discount rate isn't too hard to find. But if I give you the put price, how can I separate out the risk aversion that people have from the probability of a crash? Clearly, the higher the probability, the more the insurance cost, the bigger the put price. And the more risk averse people are, the more the put price is. And you see this all the time. Which is it, though? I'll give you a nice example. Uh, when you have a, a natural disaster like a hurricane, or in this part of the world, a typhoon. So you have a, a major uh, calamity like Katrina, which was a hurricane that hit and devastated New Orleans about five years ago. Uh, all, the, all the property and casualty insurance companies that were insuring people against those hurricane losses and flood losses suffered enormous uh, value declines. They had to pay out billions and billions of dollars. That was the bad news for them. The good news was that to this day, the price of these, in, these insurance coverage has risen significantly. So the price is a lot higher today, clearly because of the hurricane that occurred. But why is the price higher? Is the price of insurance after a hurricane or, or a, a typhoon, is it higher because the probability has risen that you're going to get another hurricane? I don't think so. I mean, the meteorologists all tell us that if you have a hurricane this year, it's not a harbinger of having a hurricane next year. They're uncorrelated from year to year. So in that case, it's probably risk aversion. People just remember how bad it was, and they'll pay more for insurance today. Uh, how can we separate those two? That's our task. We have to find a way to separate out the risk aversion from the probability, because what we're really we're interested in both, but I'm really interested in the probability. What do people think the probability of a market crash is, for example? And as I said, the binomial model and the Black-Scholes model, they can't tell you the answer to that. So we're going to outline. I'll outline for you a technology, a technique. I call it the recovery theorem. So how you can recover natural probabilities and risk aversion by just looking at option prices. You could just look at put prices or uh, the mirror image, you could look at call prices. But the starting point is something that, 
that I'll call a contingent forward price. And if we knew the contingent forward prices, we would be able to figure that out. Implicit in an option price, say I look at one-year options, and I have all sorts of different strikes for those. If I have different strikes for those, I can figure out those digital options I told you about before. I can figure out the price of an option today. It'll pay me a dollar a year from now if the market a year from now is between 1700 and 1705 And I can do that two years out and three years out and five years out. From these option prices, I can figure out forward prices. I can figure out the price today of a bet, if you will, or an option, a derivative, that'll pay you something for any possible outcome of the stock market. But that's not quite what I want. I want something much more uh, I think interesting than that. What I want to figure out is today the market's at, let's say, 1650. Every time I give this talk, it's at a different number higher. But let's say today it's at 1650. So I can tell you, given that the market's at 1650 today, uh, how much uh, it would cost me to have a dollar if the market was at 1800 a year from now or if it was 17.50 a year from now. But all of that's based on being at 16.50 today. What I want to know is something that isn't actually traded in the market. I want to know how much you would pay for the market being at 1,800, let's say a month from now, if today the market wasn't at 1,600, but it was at 1,700 or 1,400. Well, it turns out there is a nice way you can actually, from the original prices, you can figure that out. So I'll just outline it in this picture here. So if you look at this picture, so currently we're at 1600 And I can, as I said to you before, from option prices, I can figure out uh, how much you would have to pay for the market being at 1450 for a dollar if the market was at 1450 a year from now. But how do I get to 1450 if I'm at 1600 today? I have to go through 1900, or I have to go through 1800. There's a whole host of different ways you can get to 1450, but you have to go through all of these. And after you've gone through them, if you're at 1800, you can get a price. There's a price of going to 1450 if you're at 1800, and a price of going to 1450 if you're at 1700. So we can alter the final payment, and we can, in fact, Instead of looking from third quarter to the end of the year, we can look from the second quarter to the third quarter and the first quarter to the second quarter. And by this trick of looking through all these things, we can figure out those contingent forward prices I want. I can figure out the price of a dollar, uh, say a month from now, if the market's at 1500 and a dollar if it, the market gets to 1800 I can figure out all of those. The exciting thing here, of course, is going to be to use it. So what I can actually do then is recover the distribution. And I won't go through all the mathematics of it. Let me go back. That's here. But I have that equation up at the top there. So the contingent forward price, it's insurance. So it's a product of the same three things. You're going to discount the payoff you get. You're going to multiply it by risk aversion. And you're going to multiply the probability of going from uh, the market at, say, 1500 to the market at 1400 or 1800 So you're going to be able, you've got all those contingent forward prices, but now we have the problem of separating out the risk aversion. And now a second trick comes in. And the second trick is to say that risk aversion isn't just a function of uh, where you start and where you end. It's a function of the ratio of how risk averse you are at 1600 to how risk you are averse you are at 1500 and all it really comes down to, the, the formulas are much more complicated than the truth. The truth is really quite simple. If you look at this equation, PIJ is a forward price. It's a discount rate times risk aversion, VIJ, times the probability of FIJ. Let's count equations and unknowns. If there are M possible places for the stock, let's say we say the stock can be anywhere from 100 to uh, 2,000, and we break it into blocks of 50. So that'll be 50 
divided by 19 into 1900. So I can't do that quickly, but it sounds like it'd be about 30 or 40 different stock levels. So let's say it's M. So how many unknowns do we have? Well, we have M square equations, P, I, J, but we have M squared plus M squared, 2M squared unknowns. We can't solve that, but I can solve that. If I make phi i j the ratio of how risk averse you are if the market's at j to how risk averse you are if the market's at i, and the probabilities also have to add up to one. So when you add up the equations and unknowns, you have m squared plus m unknowns and m squared plus m equations. And all I'm going to do is solve those. But so much for this. I'm going to apply this now. So I'm going to pick a date, one date today. I'm going to use all the option prices that I have to get the forward prices. And then I'm going to use the forward prices to get the contingent forward prices that I need. And then I'm going to apply this recovery theorem, this adding up of equations and unknowns, and just solve the system. So I'm not going to do all the data for you. I'm going to say, <coughs> I'm just going to skip ahead. So this is the forward price surface. This is what it looks like as of now, this is as of April 27th, 2011. So on April 27th, 2011, if you were to take all the options that you saw and you were to try and figure out from them what the prices of a dollar would be one year from now if the market was at down 16% or up 8 19%, what would it look like? Well, if you look to the far end of it over here, it's really quite steep there. Because there, you're not going very far out. You're going maybe a month out. And if you're a month out, the market can't move very far. So most of its going to, action is going to be right here. And so you'll pay the most for being around here because there's no probability of being out there, really. But as the horizon lengthens, so when you're out to about three years, the surface flattens a lot. And the probability of big losses or big gains is much higher than when you're only looking one month out, three years ahead. It's not quite as flat. I just didn't draw it as well. If I put them down like this, this is, let's go like this. This is the recovered probability distribution. That's red. That's what I thought the market said it was looking forward. It thought the probability distribution of the market was going to be. So one is where it is today. One and a half is a 50% move up, half is a 50% move down. This is looking one year out, and this is and the green is the historical distribution of the market. I think this I think this might be five years out. I don't remember exactly how far out it is. This is the recovered cumulative, and this is the first really interesting numbers we have. So uh, I'm looking at the probability on May 1st, 2009 looking out one year to May 1st, 2010, what's the probability of a market drop of 50%? Well, if you looked into history and you looked at the 60 years before this, the chance was five, uh, that would be, let's say, five one-hundredths of 1%. One I know it's, I think it's five one-thousandths of 1%. One and the chance of a 40% drop is 17 one-thousandths of 1%. One and I think the chance of a 5% drop, I think the market thought at that time, rather, that it was 17 or 41. The market views the distribution as having a fatter tail. It thinks the likelihood of a big drop is higher than history. These are the statistics at the time. So historically, the average return on the market as of May 1st, 2009 was 8.4%. What I recovered from option prices was 9.8%. And because interest rates were so low, the return over the interest rate was 7% from the recovered, but only 3% from the historical. A very big difference. The standard deviation wasn't much different. The sharp ratio was very high. So I actually did this before I knew the result. Well, not quite before I knew the results, but this is quite remarkable. If this is really true, it says the market predicted the immense rise we've had from 2009 to the present and thought it was pretty certain because it had a very sharp ratio associated with a very high sharp ratio associated with it. Notice the big difference between the at-the-money volatility. 
So if you're looking at implied volatilities, some of you might know about that, it was much higher than what I recovered, or the historical at the time. Here's a copy, that's called the VIX, the implied volatility. Here's a plot of the actual volatility six months uh, in the past against the VIX. And here it is uh, spread out a little bit. So we just changed the time scale so it was a better prediction. And you can see that the implied volatility in the stock market in the options market, rather, pretty much plots against the actual volatility. How do we do? <coughs> pardon me. How do we do with uh, this recovered probability? It does even better. It's much closer to the actual realized volatility. So this is a regression, and the thing to focus on is right here. So what I'm doing is plotting, uh, regressing the actual realized volatility on the recovered volatility, and I'm getting a T statistic of close to three, which for these kinds of things over a short period, only four years, people who work with stock market data know that's pretty good. But of course, people are really interested in the return. This is the expected return that I recovered from the market versus what actually happened, the one month return. So I'm looking at one month out and saying what happened. The red is what was expected, what we recovered. And you can see it tracks pretty closely. It does pretty well. And then if you do the regression, it does a very good result. It's a regression of three, which is the highest I've ever seen. And Corley is about the same thing. So as you can see, I'm quite excited. It's a, this is my way of peeking into the future. And I'm going to test this methodology, and a lot of other people will. We're going to be providing people with these predictions over the past 12 years, uh, monthly predictions for 12 years. And then you'll be able to see, did the market actually do what the, what the option market predicted it would do? And I want to compare these predictions with other models, dividend yield models and the like. And I think it's going to be valuable for a host of different things. The research has been extended to the fixed income market by uh, a lot of people. And in the end, the goal is actually to make this useful. So I want to publish a monthly report on at least two things. I want to tell people what the option prices are saying is the expected return on the stock market. So you can use it for asset allocation. And lastly, I want to tell you what the probability of a crash or a boom is going to be, or at least what the market thinks it's going to be. So thank you. Why don't we uh, open this up for questions now? Hi. Hi, I think we have time for two questions. So if you can just raise your hand, there will be two people walking around with a microphone. Maybe one right here in the front. Morning, good morning, Professor Ross. Great honor to speak with you. And I read your paper, and uh, I read uh, your slides from last year's conference, and uh, some other people's comments, and uh, the, their explanation of your model. And uh, I still vaguely understand how you do it. <laughs> but, but I have seen uh, that since you published the uh, findings, there's a lot of controversies evolving around your uh, theory, and. Uh, and uh, these are these uh, some, some typical questions from the uh, maybe from the trading or the industry standpoint of view. That is, they say that your uh, situation, that your theorem is really uh, depend on these uh, so-called representative investors' utility functions, and uh, you had to find some state variable rich enough to describe the world economy. Maybe maybe so you you are limited to predicting certain scenarios, not. Uh, all the securities, and you have to find these uh, derivative securities to cover, to return on these state variables. So maybe, maybe you, since the last year, maybe you have solved these questions. So please give us a more uh, clean and approachable <laughs> explanation. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I haven't solved them all, and I don't think I'll live long enough to solve them all. But uh, some of the things, some of the questions are wrong. Uh, the theory doesn't really depend upon a representative individual, uh, not at all. It just depends upon the same thing that option pricing does, the absence of arbitrage. 
it depends on an assumption about what the kernel looks like, that risk aversion that I talked about. So that's an assumption. But like any assumption, we can't figure out if it's true or false from an a priori ground. The only way to figure out if it's true or false is to test it empirically. Now, I'd like more option prices, and I do accept that it's certainly limited in its appeal uh, and its applicability. If I can do it for the stock market alone, I consider that a nice, uh, nice result. Uh, can I do it for all the markets everywhere in the world? No, of course not. Uh, I can do it for fixed income, though, and I can do it for stocks. Uh, how well I do it, again, that can't be answered by a priori philosophy and theory. It can only be answered by taking the, the results to the data and empirically testing it, and that's what we have to do. Theories don't stand, theories are just exercises in logic. You don't find out if they're true or not. You can decide if the logic is correct, uh, but you really only decide if they explain the world by taking them to the data and seeing if they really are consistent with what you see in the world. Okay, thank you. I think we have one final question in the middle. Is this on? Uh, Sean Maceros. Um, the, there we go. Thank you, Sean Maceros. Uh, question is with respect to your option pricing volatility model. Uh, it didn't seem to account for the differences in liquidity that we might see in the market. And I wanted to find out, in your opinion, uh, Doctor, how your model might account for the maybe enhanced survivorship bias that this enhanced or increased liquidity could create. And finally, how maybe perhaps a lack of liquidity could create a, a difference in your model where you've got simply a much larger risk aversion than, than otherwise your model would state. Thank you. That, that's a wonderful question uh, and one that I've been giving a lot of thought to. And you're exactly right. Uh, maybe a nice thing to do, if you go back to that picture I showed you, I can show you directly what a nice representation of a lack of liquidity by looking at the volatility surface. So those are the prices that you see and people who trade in this market know that those prices aren't just about expectations, they're also about liquidity issues. So if you look and you see how uh, the prices of long dated options rise relative to short dated, <coughs> pardon me, uh, one of the reasons for that is that there's a persistent demand for options of long maturities by institutions such as insurance companies that are trying to hedge out variable annuities they've sold. That doesn't have a lot to do with uh, expectations. It just has a lot to do with the necess necessity they face of having to hedge the contracts that they've issued and they've sold. So you're exactly right. Uh, my theory in the way I've interpreted it isn't quite uh, by its, it doesn't stand all by itself, but I think I'll, I'll say mea culpa, but uh, I think there's a lot of hope here for a different reason. When you look at the term structure of interest rates, certainly the swaps curve of sovereign rates, it's hard to believe that there's a lot of liquidity issues there. It's mostly about what the market thinks expectations of future rates are going to be. But here in the volatility surface, this is a smaller market. It's a market of about $25 trillion on, say, the U.S. Uh, S&P options. Uh, you have $1,000 trillion worth of interest rate stuff. And so at different points on the surface, issues of illiquidity arise. Here's my hope. What I call risk aversion is what a combination of two things. It's a combination of risk aversion and illiquidity. In the same way that... Uh, when Katrina comes through, it's not just that risk aversion rises. People also mistakenly do risk aversion. So there's some behavioral things that enter in there. I think the same thing's going on here. And my hope is that when we actually recover the risk aversion, we'll be able to interpret it as a combination of two things, risk aversion and uh, illiquidity demand and supply considerations on this surface. And it might give us a window into seeing both of those things. So that's my hope. And uh, once again, it is an empirical issue. We can't solve it theoretically. OK, thank you. We're all set, Professor Ross. Thank you.